You know when you move someplace and you have trouble meeting people? That was me. It was about two months after I moved to Brooklyn that I decided I needed human contact. I decided to start with a dating site. Not because romance was the first thing on my mind, but I felt like it was the best way to meet like-minded people. The results I got after I made the page surprised me. I guess something about country mouse lonely and lost in the large cold city was very attractive to some people. Most of the messages I got were default greetings, pickup lines, and silly games like 20 questions to get to know each other. After a while, though, I matched with a particular girl who stood out to me. It had nothing to do with her looks. I don't think she even said anything to me that was amazing. The tone of the conversation was just very different from all the messages. The content was the same. Mostly, you know, the silly getting to know each other games. In a pace that made my head spin, we matched, we talked, and then we were meeting up for salads. It was my first date since college, so I was very nervous and felt out of practice. But I dressed my TGIF best and headed for the cafe that Wednesday morning. I walked in, standing awkwardly in the doorway, scanning for my date, not wanting to walk in the wrong direction or wanting to walk too deep in the cafe if I got stood up. Eventually, I spotted her. What I saw surprised me. She wasn't one of those people who looked completely different from her profile pictures. It's just, you know... Profile pictures don't give you the full story. For one thing, she was tall. About a head taller than everyone else in the cafe. Her eyes were fierce and commanding like traffic lights in the middle of the night. When she saw me, she gave me the warmest smile like I was her oldest friend, quickly walking over to me. I smiled back, giving a small wave. When we were only a few feet apart, she stared at me, seeming to hesitate on what her very first words to me in person would be. After a few moments of silent staring, I came to the conclusion that I had to break the ice. How are you? she asked, genuinely. I responded generically, thinking how odd it was to not try and say hello in some form of way first. She motioned over to a small table that had a well-taken-care-of brown coat sitting on one of the chairs. I sat down, noticing the lovely floor-to-ceiling window that framed the entire table. Before I even had a fully thought-out idea of starting small talk, she struck again. Do you want to split a drink? I was very taken aback. Yes, this was a date. But not only was it bold to share a drink, but downright cheesy. However, her clean appearance and friendly but polite presence made me croak out a sure. She waved over the waiter and, without even glancing from my opinion, ordered a cherry cola. Huh, I said out loud, not realizing I did before she stared at me. Oh, uh, that's my favorite soda. She gave me a look that made me feel very bashful. Not in the butterflies-in-your-stomach kind of way. More like when you were giving a present to your close friend and you were praying deep within your soul that they love it. Huh, she teased back, smirking a little. Me too. We small-talked for a while about our experiences with the dating site until our soda came. We put our straws in, 
hers confidently and gracefully, mine precise and calculated. We both leaned in for a sip right after that. I avoided eye contact, feeling my face get hot. When she pulled away, I noticed she had a very lovely shade of lipstick on. Pale orange, like a sunset. Seeming to hug and fit on her lips like a sweater. The waiter waited patiently as we finished our soda sips, asking what we wanted as our meal. She allowed me the liberty of ordering on my own this time. As the date progressed, our small talk turned into getting to know each other. Or more, I guess, getting to know me. She went from polite and somewhat professional to suddenly raining down a million questions on me. What was my family like? Favorite animal? Hair care routine? Dream vacation spot? Where do I see myself in five years? I answered all of these questions to the best of my ability, realizing that she hasn't touched her food once during this entire exchange. She did take a few sips of soda, however. With each answer I gave, she seemed to calculate it carefully. Like Anubis weighing hearts. She had three reactions, I noted. One was a soft hum and a nod. Another was a raised eyebrow and narrowing of the eyes. And the other was a frown and a head tilt. Just when I thought I was caught in a never-ending loop, she got up. Her sudden actions and the reminder of how tall she really was surprised me. Don't you have to go to work soon? She asked, looking through her purse. I glanced at my phone, being surprised again, but this time, learning that two and a half hours have passed. I stood up, getting my own purse and coat together, calculating train times in my head. You can have the last sip. I got the bill. That brought me back to remembering where I was and what I was doing, nervousness and dread settling in the pit of my stomach. I realized I learned nothing about her. She did nothing but ask questions about me, and I don't recall asking one about her. Not even a, how are you? I was pretty sure I blew this date and had no chance of salvaging it. Well, we will see each other again, right? Trade numbers or something? I felt like an asshole. Who would ask that after such an awful date? But it came out of my mouth before I could stop myself. She finished putting on her coat before looking at me with a smile that filled me head to toe. She walked over to me, close enough to notice that she smelled like holiday dinner from outside the house on a snowy day. She grabbed both my hands tightly, staring dead in my eyes. Her hands were surprisingly rough, with chipped pink nail polish on them. A tight hold on my hand, eyes burrowing into mine her breath on my lips, smiling ear to ear, she promised the country mouse. You are going to do just fine here. We both left the cafe without another word, my brain still trying to digest the words that she said. However, just like the color of her lipstick implied, she was gone like a sunset, leaving a sense of wonder and making you feel smaller, but more humble. She never got on her online profile again the last message to her from me saying I would be there in 15. I'm not mad or upset or even disappointed. To me, she was like an initiation into the city, a welcome parade, her words being a welcome package on my doorstep. Nothing in this city has ever come close to making me feel that home here. It's been several years since that encounter. Safe to say I'm a bit more confident and settled to where I belong here now. That memory is still crystal clear, however, like there is a rerun of it I catch on television every night. However, and you can call this my mistrusting nature, but 
Sometimes I feel like I don't understand the situation as much as I think I do. Like, the longer I sit on it, the more I remember it, I'm starting to double think. What exactly did she mean by here? February 22nd, 2036, 8.49 p.m. Victim is a Vietnamese male, early 30s, approximately 241 pounds, 5 feet 10 inches. On their wrist appears to be a tattoo of a wine bottle, pouring over a piano. Medical records that were pulled shows a medical history of nicotine use. Dark bruises around their neck look to be around hand size. According to Amelia on site, she said there are no broken bones in the trauma area. According to Kipper, they were found 12 hours after death at a friend of theirs' apartment by the maintenance man. Said friend had an alibi. They have been out of state for at least four days on a business trip. Kipper insisted that I had to know this information before handing me the file. I swear, sometimes they just like hearing themselves talk. I kept telling them the only thing I needed was his time of death, which I know Amelia gave me in the file. All of this other information is wasted time. Especially because I was actually asked to take some samples and do a full toxology report, as well as write up my own report on the cause of death. Normally, I would think that's just the higher-ups being anal. But this was a request from Amelia herself. Amelia has a very strong brain on her, so if she wants me to double-check something, I'll do it. I just don't know why she wouldn't want someone more... specialized to have an input. I mean, my team and I usually spend most of the day filling out death certificates. So, I guess this is a nice change of pace for the end of my shift. I'll take six blood samples. I'll label it and leave it in the lab log for them to pick up and look at tomorrow morning. Should I take some hair samples for them, too? Seems like a safe bet, just so this poor fellow can get back to his family quicker and we won't have to bother him after he's buried. Let him rest a little bit before his big day of saying goodbye to the world. I haven't been to a funeral in a long time. I mean, I guess that's a good thing, right? All of the recent funerals I went to were work-related. So, yeah, honestly, it's a very good thing. Now that I think about it, I think my dad's funeral was the only personal one I went to. It's a shame I don't remember a lot about his funeral. I've always had a weird outlook on death. So did he, actually. I probably got it from him. He's probably just fine knowing I don't remember much of when he was put in the ground. I think that's why I don't mind this job too much, nor was Dad surprised when I told him which education route I was going down. There are lots of things that are proofs and reality checks that we are living on this planet nicknamed Earth. Death is one of them. However, depending on when, where, and who you are, you handle this fact very differently. Death in Brooklyn doesn't have the same culture like it does in Montana. And while both these places share a sort of culture with death within the house that's right next to each other, Neighbors in the same city and town, their own thoughts of death could differ. Alright, got the hair and blood samples. Going to start a basic examination now. When you live in the city with the highest population in the country, death is going to happen a lot more frequently. 
people say it's because it's more dangerous, but that's because they don't look at the statistics. Are more people going to die if there are 30 people or 50 people? 50, because there are more bodies. Here, there are thousands of more bodies than everywhere else in the country. More bodies to get sick, more bodies to get old, more bodies to stab, or shoot, or run over, or strangle. When you are surrounded and bombarded with it, you end up becoming a little desensitized to it. Just be a little safer than normal and everything will be okay. Do you think people are actually afraid of death, or are they afraid of not having the choice to die? Humans in general are control freaks. I don't know why they throw that phrase around like it never applies to them. I think it's perfectly normal and a universal want of every single person. No matter who you are, you want to die on your own terms. You would be damned to let someone take that from you. I wonder if this poor person had even a death close to his own terms. Did he know he was going to... Wait. No. Hold on. Wait, in his heart, in in his heart, specifically through his ventricle, probably stabbing through the left one, it, it's a knife. I, 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 I shouldn't remove it. I, it looks like a hunting knife, maybe about three and a half inches. It's impossible. There's, there's no sign of outside incisions at, at all. No, no recent trauma besides the bruises are are on him. There's no way he could have just been walking around with a knife in his heart like this. <laughs> <laughs>